FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is 7 8 20. Well, you've seen the social unrest that's taken place, the riots, the Black Lives Matter. Everyone seems to have a hand in this. Antifa, all these great uh, organizations. Uh, you probably saw the situation in St. Louis where people are minding their own business, having uh, tea on the deck, having cocktails. And all of a sudden, a mob breaks into their development and they go get their guns after they were directly threatened. And now what? Well, like your opinion on it, were they justified or did they overstep? Well, the email address for your opinion is kl at kerrylutz.com. That's kl at kerrylutz.com. Uh, attorney John O'Connor is with us. We're going to be talking about his book after Postgate, how the Washington Post betrayed Deep Throat, covered up Watergate, and began today's partisan advocacy journalism. Uh, John, it's great to have you on the show, and welcome. So, McCloskey, is he a villain or a hero? Well, I'll tell you what he is, is he's a guy who, as it turns out, and just right, it was kind of a brinksmanship maneuver. Um, Query what would have happened had the mob uh, descended upon him. Was he going to shoot or not? If he was, if he shot, and if he had some reasonable means of escaping the mob, he would probably be charged with murder, um, and or at least second degree murder. Now, I'm not sure. I can't tell from the pictures where, where whether he had a means of escape, and that's very important in the law the way it's defined now. At common law, you didn't need a means of escape. Somebody threatened your property. You could you could use deadly force to defend it Uh, throughout our history and the history of Western civilization. That's been the law. And that's why, you know, people have been out there with their shotguns defending their properties. I'm going to shoot you if you trespass. Now, today, most uh, places will say unless you have a home is your castle law, a stand your ground law, uh, you've got to escape. You've got to take off if you can, if you have a reasonable means of egress. Now, in this case, I looked at this, it looks like a housing development with pretty tight, you know, quarters there, Uh, you know, big mansions, one stack next to another. They may not have been able to get out of there. So anyway, right now, what happened was it ended up perfectly. That is to say, the mob was not stupid enough to descend upon him, nor, nor would McCluskey stupid enough to shoot him. Uh, and so I don't think they did anything wrong. I don't think it's an assault to stand there with your weapons. Uh, the DA is now looking whether this is an assault. An assault can be a threat. You know, when you say assault and battery, an assault is actually a threatened battery is what it is. But I don't think this was a threat. I don't think they're going to get prosecuted. So he did it. The couple did it fine. And it worked out. Now, what would have happened had the mob descended on them would have been a real thorny situation. And they might have gotten prosecuted if they decided to spray bullets there. Um, uh, So and, and I think it's unfortunate. I think I'm sort of after this incident, I'm sort of in favor of I think 18 states or so have 20 states have stand your ground laws. Home is your castle. Sometimes they call it yes. um, castle. And so castle doctrine. And, and I'm, I'm in favor of it after this, especially when you have these mobs that are going to come after you, not even to steal your stuff, just to, for the heck of it. Let's just destroy this house. So, um, but thank God uh, it all worked out well and nobody was hurt. Well, that's the purpose of a gun. It isn't in a defensive, purely defensive use. You shoot the person as the last resort. And in this case, well, if he was in Florida, he would have been covered. We have Castle Doctrine here. We have Stand Your Ground. In fact, the Castle Doctrine even applies to your car in Florida. So you're allowed to carry a handgun in your vehicle without any kind of carry permit based on the Castle Doctrine. And really, it's one thing if he would have been prosecuted, another thing or actually a jury to convict they're always reluctant in these cases even where there is a duty to retreat and what is a duty to retreat like you said uh, you have to have clear means to rapidly extricate yourself from the situation which we have no indication that he did here does that mean you just go hide in your house and wait for them to break down the door 
is that is that a valid means of retreat or do you have to actually get out of the area where you're under threat um really the, this is a case where the common law got it right and all of our modern modern law in my opinion have gotten it totally wrong right right and we have gone too far we've bent too far uh, in favor of really the lawless of the criminal uh, and Society has to protect itself. You want to protect people. You want to protect the criminal. You hope the criminals don't get killed if they're just stealing something and so forth. But uh, there's a certain deterrent factor, and we all recognize it. I am not going to go steal a candy bar from somebody if I think I'm going to get shot, even though that's a disproportionate punishment (laughs) for it. I'm still not going to go steal that candy bar. You know, uh, and so it works. The deterrence actually works. That's the thing about it. And so uh, I wish we did have that castle doctrine all over the place. Uh, but anyway, God bless the McCluskeys. They made it through this thing and good for them. Yeah. And their neighbors are upset with them now, too. They basically defended the whole neighborhood, got these people, the mob out of there because it was either <laughs> we're going to go further or we're going to die. And that's the thanks they get for preserving their neighbor's property. You know, it just, John, it makes me uh, think of a no good deed shall go unpunished. Well, that's right. And what happens is the other people are so cowardly uh, that they just don't like the idea that uh, McCloskey's didn't sacrifice their home so that, you know, it's it's really appeasement. It's really appeasement. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, it's like we all, you know, the Western society clapped for Neville Chamberlain when he came back from Germany. Well, where did that get us, guys? Uh, you know, appeasement is not always the best policy. In fact, it most of the time is not because the psychology says you appease somebody and they come back for more. Yeah, there's no appeasing uh, the mob, and that's uh, that's, right. that's very clear here. And it's common sense, and yet when the law goes against common sense, we wind up with these anomalous situations where somebody's clearly under threat, acts to defend yourself, and then winds up getting prosecuted. Obviously, the Castle Doctrine, Stand Your Ground, which are two distinct doctrines of law, Uh, can be abused. And we've seen that happen. And you know what? Then the law steps in and prosecutes because they say, you stood your ground, but maybe technically you were right, but really your intention was to, and this happened in Florida, to actually murder somebody rather than to just protect yourself as a defensive means. So it's, it's it's a shield, as we like to say in the law, and not a sword. Well, that's right. The Castle Doctrine doesn't say you can kill people (laughs) unnecessarily. It just says you don't have to flee for self-defense purposes. You can you but you still have to defend. It still has to be legitimate self-defense. That's the main thing. The Castle Doctrine just says you don't have to run away. But still, if you kill somebody, it's got to be legit uh, self-defense. And what you just gave me, there was a segue when you talked about the mob. And here's my big thing that applies to the McCluskeys and it applies to so many other issues. Where is our media, the larger media in condemning the mob and all the looting? Because remember the McCluskey thing happened at the tail end of so much of this looting and lawlessness. If the mob is not getting the uh, good press, they're not going to do it. Most of these people are doing it for political purposes. They're good getting together, thinking they're going to get something out of it. Then, of course, some people take advantage with the looting and so forth. But there are other there are organizers here. But it's the mob concept. Now, the founding fathers talked a lot about mobs. Mobs are not a new invention. Uh, mobs are natural. Anytime you have democracy, you have mobs. James Madison said that um, uh, liberty to... Uh, factionalism is like air to fire. If you have liberty, there will be factionalism. And by factionalism, they talked about mob and mobocracy. And that's what they were talking about, really toxic factionalism. And what was their remedy in the Federalist Papers? What was their remedy for the obvious threat of factionalism and mob rule? It was the free press. The free press would let everybody know theoretically that uh, you know the, this person or that person leading the mob was not 
motivated correctly. They're either idiots or greedy or pulling a con job on somebody. And that's what the press was supposed to do. Now, um, uh, where are we on this? Where, where are we today? Well, unfortunately, and I think, by the way, I think they're absolutely right. And luckily, we have talk radio and smaller Internet sites where this is true, where the truth is getting out. The problem is the national reach. The people who have the national reach in the media are actually fueling toxic factionalism. They're covering for the mob. And once you have a so-called free press that, at least in the major media, are covering for the mob, guess what? The mob likes it. They turn on TV and, hey, they're heroes, aren't they? Yeah. So so it gets me to the whole idea of a really a corrupt media, corrupt mainstream media. And that's that's the reason I wrote Postgate is I not doing it to make money. I'm, if I even make up half my cost, I'll consider myself a lucky guy. But I've worked on it for years and have read 3000 post articles. And my conclusion is that, that the Watergate reporting as significant as it was really led to today's uh, terrible factional uh, really uh, corrupt media. Uh, and, and it sort of was by accident. It was by accident. The Post was really protecting, and I talk about it in the book. It's a very juicy book, by the way. There's so much stuff in here, you can't believe it. You'll say, yeah, did I this really wait. happen? Did this really happen? Did this happen? <laughs> it was, you're, you're, you're telling me why haven't I? And then the other question people are going to ask is, why haven't I heard this before? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> and, question there. And, and the reason is, and the reason is what? <laughs> when you yeah. ask somebody, why haven't you heard of it before? It's because the media doesn't report it. Yeah, and well, so, that's, you know, that's their job. I wrote an article, John, a while ago called Disconnecting the Dots. And the media's purpose now is to portray every event that happens in contemporary society as unrelated to every other event happening so that they don't have to dig up anything and they don't have to connect the dots. That used to be their main purpose. And we should mention, uh, John, that your book, uh, which uh, was out the end of last year, Postgate, How the Washington Post Betrayed Deep Throat, Covered Up Watergate, and Began Today's Partisan advocacy journalism, which they're no longer journalists. They are really uh, progressive left-wing activists with a microphone, right? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Osino Resources is a Ross Beattie-backed gold exploration company in mining-friendly Namibia. Osino's district-scale land package is situated near two producing gold mines, one of which Osino's management team previously developed and sold to B2 Gold. Osino's founders and management are experienced mining professionals who have already successfully developed and sold two companies in the past seven years. Osino has a tight share structure, and with its current treasury, it can self fund the advancement of its gold discovery into at least 2022. This is an exploration company with drills turning that you'll definitely want to pay attention to. Osino trades in New York under the ticker O-S-I-I-F and in Toronto under the ticker O-S-I. To learn more, go to OsinoResources.com. That's OsinoResources.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Right, right. They're shills that are just really repeat talking points. And a very, very good point was raised. And I hadn't quite thought of it so much uh, until I read Lee Smith's book, The Plot Against, uh, I think it's The Plot Against Trump. It might have been The Plot Against America, Lee Smith's book. And what he talked about was actually pretty smart. And what he said was these newspapers, especially, uh, and even the major television stations, no longer have dedicated investigators. They don't have staffs that research a story on their own for months. They have to get fed by other organizations. They've cut out all their resources, and they're dependent upon government sources to fill their uh, stories. And so what happens is there's a competition. And what happens is people become uh, just shills. PR people for the White House, you're going to get a leak from James Comey, for example, or you're going to get a leak from somebody uh, only if you print what they say. Now, the White House doesn't have that power, oddly enough. You would think they would since they're the White House. Uh, it's, it's other people that seem to have the power because of the leftist slant of the media. Uh, but, you know, uh, any intelligence agency could get anything it wanted printed during Russiagate. Um, and, uh, 
and and that's what was going on. So what happens is is the press not only is left as leaning, but also can't do its own research. So it has to depend upon these people to get fed. Yeah, it's so true. And you know, this is the way it works in Congress as well. You know, the media for a story, they want it prepackaged, wrapped up in a bow, and put in their laps. Because look, they'd rather be at the bar drinking. Uh, journalism is a notoriously alcoholic profession, both on the screen and off the screen. And look, Congress is the same way. They no longer write laws. The lobbyists write the laws and send it to their favorite congressperson, and then they're passed. So we've got this laziness, inherent laziness and abdication of responsibility on a massive scale. scale. So let's talk about like what exactly really went down with Watergate how come we don't know the real story? Well, uh, you know, again, we have uh, uh, Watergate, and I go through this, and I, and I show step by step how the Post covered up the real facts. I, ta- I show the real facts, I show the evidence, and I show the evidence that the Post had, and then I show how they didn't say that, and they said something completely different. Uh, now, why don't we know about, why is it, here's what I think, why is it that, you know, basically uh, an old lawyer in San Francisco, 46 years later, is coming up with this stuff? Why is it, what, what's everybody been doing in those 46 years? Good question. Well, well they've been journalists who, <laughs> who are partisan advocacy journalists. And that's what, uh, and so the Post necessarily, as they're covering up Watergate, they're really cutting the template for everyone else covering up for this stuff. Um, think about it. No one has, in spite of all the journalists uh, and journalism schools to study Watergate, no one has said anything. Why? Well, one reason is Watergate journalists promoted everybody from being hacks who hang out, uh, you know, in dive bars. With bad hats. To being, and with bad hats. You know, with bad, yeah, with bad hats. <laughs> Bat hats and New York accents and, you know, and so forth and so on. And, you know, kind of uh, dames, uh, you know, down on their luck. And now they're at the finest hotels having the finest uh, wine and cheese uh, known to man. And they're hobnobbing with the uh, top of Washington. It used to be in, and I, I read a book recently that really sort of opened my eyes, muckraking. Yeah. was looked down upon, was looked down upon in our more civilized 20th century. So you had people out there digging up dirt, but even when they dug it up well, like Jack Anderson and Drew Pearson, they were sort of looked at as class B citizens. And, oh, well, maybe they come up with something, but no, we're not going to dirty ourselves with that kind of stuff. Well, now any kind of diatribe is considered investigative reporting. Uh, it is very hard for a journalist to say, oh, by the way, our exalted status is undeserved. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're really hacks in the guise of being something we're not. And secondly, by giving the public our opinions, we are the least expert of all opinion makers. We are not capable <laughs> of discerning what the truth is. Remember what Mark felt deep throat, the greatest source for journalism in the 20th century, what my client told Woodward. He said, I distrust the press. They're shallow, superficial, and too quick to make judgments. He's absolutely right. And that's on a good now, day. On a good day, they like that. <laughs> that's on a good day. And now we've promoted him to world-class... Uh, arbiters you know, of the truth. Uh, truth tellers. And, and they're not. And they're the most incapable people because by definition, if you're out there pumping out uh, press every day, you're supposed to skate on the service and do who, what, when, where. This guy said this, this guy said that. Okay, let's move on to the next day. And that's a fine service. But to then try to tell us that you really know about Russian collusion or Ukraine, oh, a lie. you don't. You don't. And usually you get it wrong. And when you get it wrong, it has tremendously profound consequences. Uh, Trump was handcuffed in his ability to deal with the Russians over the last few years because of this Russian thing. And he said it. And then when he complains, Mueller's team writes it up as possible obstruction. Yeah. <laughs> Trump's complaining that his foreign policy was limited. Yeah. Yeah. That's what a president should do when his foreign policy is hamstrung. Now, another thing that happened was, guess where Ukraine is now? Ukraine is now tilting pro-Russian and it is now controlled by oligarchs. 
Why? Why? Precisely because the last chance we had of controlling uh, Zelensky's oligarch patron, Igor Kolomoisky, came when Trump asked for a corruption investigation. Yes. Uh, the, the, the impeachment scared everyone off of that. And now guess what? Igor Kolomoisky is, is back out of exile into Ukraine. He's controlling Zelensky, who he owned the television station where Zelensky uh, became a, a, a national well-known comedian. Kolomoisky is back demanding his bank from which he had robbed $5.6 billion of U.S. funds. Okay, now we've put four five point six million back in. The bank is okay. It's been seized. It had been seized by the honest prosecutors that uh, Joe Biden tried to fire. Uh, now, now he's back asking for his bank back with five point six billion stuck in there. So now he'll he can steal that money steal again. Steal it again, yeah. Well, but he's also he's also tilting the country toward Russia. Now, now, now the country is decidedly pro-Russian because of this. Yeah, and hey. Let's look at the whole coronavirus, you know, COVID-19. Trump comes out and says hydroxychloroquine could be a real game changer. I'm hopeful. Don't know for sure if it's going to work, but really hopeful. And what happens? The media and, of course, the, uh, the CDC said, oh, no, it's poisonous. And people are drinking fish tank cleaner because of the hydroxychloroquine, which turned out to be a lie. As a result, it isn't given out. Certain governors like uh, the governor of Michigan and New York actually put moratoriums, barred doctors from prescribing it. And now we find out three months later that over 70% of the people that get the cocktail of hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and uh, antibiotics. Zipromax. Yeah, yeah Zipromax. Yeah, yeah Zpax. Basically, they survive. And think of all the tens of thousands of people that have died because of the media's irresponsibility here. It's right. shocking. And there- Yes. And, 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 you know, and then, of course, the media just loves it when a study shows that it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work once you have you have it real bad and the and the uh, cytokine storm is in yeah. full force. Then you can take hydroclox- hydroxychloroquine. It's not going to do any good. It's it's best. And there just a study came out. It's best at early stages. Exactly. And that's what the media has been working against the stuff costs 50 cents a pill yeah, people God have forbid. been taking it people have been taking it for years phil uh mickelson has taken it probably for 15 years 75 arthritis yeah, yeah 75 years the drug has been in use since 1945 and right you know and the media pooh poos it and it also is shown to work prophylactically because people in countries where they have malaria and they regularly take hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine had a far less incidence of COVID-19. And this was, if I knew it, and I don't consider myself a journalist per se, then certainly anyone who has Google on their phone could have figured this stuff out. And yet they refused not to, and they cost people their lives. Well, right. Now, interesting, the way the media played it up when it first came out, this hydroxychloroquine thing, they said, oh, my gosh. Well, you know, uh, Rita Wilson, Tom Hanks's wife, uh, she had it in Australia. They gave it to her and she had side effects. Oh, and there were bad side effects. She got nauseous and she really didn't like those side effects. And so everybody said, oh, my God, it's got side effects. Rita Wilson got side effects. Oh, this is dangerous stuff. Well, there's no doubt she probably got side effects from it. However, what nobody asked was, gee, did her, did, did their physicians, yeah. did, did they think it helped? Well, they both, guess what? They both uh, recovered from it famously. They don't have any yeah. uh, lingering problems and nobody, nobody's reported that. Gee, they got out of it. So, of course, Tom Hanks didn't have any side effects. She did. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but guess what? They both came back hale and hearty, and you know he's out there doing his thing. She is. Uh, they and and so <laughs> is that good reporting? Stupidity. I don't think so. It's pure it? stupidity. And I, I'm looking at the chart today of COVID nineteen deaths. Understanding that Dr. Burke said twenty five percent of them, it's probably overstated by twenty five percent. If you ask the average person on the street how many people you think in America died of COVID nineteen yesterday. 
you get uh, five, 10,000 at least. And you know what the real number is? 244 on July 6th. That's 244 out of 330 million people. Uh, I right. think my drive, you know, to uh, the supermarket is a lot more dangerous and uh, a lot more life threatening than this virus. Not to say it's not serious, but we're at the tail well, end right. of it now. It's petering out and the media won't let the story go. It's like they won't let the dog die. Well, even if you take those 244 deaths, how many of those were really uh, were, were older people? I do nothing against it. I'm an older person, I <laughs> yeah, guess. Uh, get, I will be so that's, soon. <laughs> that's why I'm talking from under my bed, by the way. I, I you know, but uh, but how many of those are, are these sort of fake deaths? I did a lot of study on CDC and the way they keep statistics uh, because I did a lot of tobacco litigation, and mm. you know what happens is. If you die, if you're supposed to live to be 82 and you die when you're 77 and you smoke during your life and you died of, of heart problems, well, they list that as a death from tobacco. Of Even though you may have stopped, you may have stopped 15 years earlier. It doesn't make any difference. Your lungs may have been pink, but you died because of tobacco. And so they count that off. That's a tobacco death. Well, that just <laughs> used to make the tobacco companies furious. That guy didn't die because of smoking. Now, if you have somebody that dies of lung cancer or is smoking and, and really has some COPD yeah. and all that, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. You, that's a legit death from smoking. Let's not sugarcoat it. But, but so it really does kind of um, uh, ruin the whole idea of keeping statistics. Why keep them if they're not going to be fairly represented? of what's going on but but your point is well taken whether it's 244 or 150 doesn't make much difference uh it's not a high amount uh, oh. and now uh i i do think that if you had if people had these palliatives like hydroxy and so forth they a lot of people who survive could have avoided more serious consequences. I think that's the more serious question is how many people are getting, uh, yeah, you know, uh, for no reason. Yeah, when it was yeah avoidable. Exa exactly. Exactly. And how many people have lingering effects afterwards that are bad? I don't know that. I just don't know that. That's what I'd like to know is how many yeah. people are cured from it that have these horrible, uh, you know, after effects. That's something we ought to look at, but I don't. I don't know what the number is. <laughs> I'd like to know too, but certain things were just. It's going to be years before we know. So the book Postgate: How the Washington Post Betrayed Deep Throat, Covered Up Watergate, and Began Today's Partisan Advocacy Journalism, and it's by John O'Connor. It's available on Amazon and wherever fine books used to be sold. And any questions or comments? please email me, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Go to our site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for a free newsletter. John, been an absolute pleasure. Great luck on the book. It's been a blast. Take care of yourself now. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.